we do have indeed a uh, exciting topic ahead of us that we're going to consider in the time that we have allotted. And we're going to be taking a look specifically at this prophecy that we just had read out of Ezekiel 38. Because you see, the words that were just read have not yet been fulfilled. There has not been a time through the entire course of mankind, the history of mankind, where the events that we just read in Ezekiel 38, which end with Jesus Christ coming back to this earth, those events have not happened yet. And so what we're going to look at tonight is what we expect to see happening in the alignment of the nations, and specifically what current events are happening today and in the last year, which point to the fact that indeed the nations are aligning themselves as required for the events that are written for us in Ezekiel chapter 38 to come to pass. Now thousands of years ago, the Bible predicted that before Jesus' second coming, the nation of Russia would attempt to assert her dominance in the Middle East and begin another world war. And tonight we are going to look at the events that are recorded for us in Bible prophecy, specifically here in Ezekiel 38, regarding this great conflict that gives rise to Christ's second coming and the establishment of God's kingdom here upon earth. And we'll look at what has been happening in the news with the nations to see how they're acting to fulfill God's prophetic word. The objective of our time together tonight will be to examine the cast of characters and the nations that are involved in this final crisis that occurs and is closely linked with Jesus' second coming. So we had the first 16 verses of Ezekiel chapter 38 read. And the rest of the chapter, as I mentioned, if we were, were to read on, speaks of the destruction of this confederacy of nations that invades the land of Israel. Now, as with most things, it's helpful to ask a few questions. Typically, in school, we learn to ask the five W's and the one H. And so we'll ask when. When does this prophecy take place? And as I mentioned, it hasn't happened yet. Now, we're going to be talking about a number of elements of these verses, but one of the keys is to see in the last verse read in verse 16 that it says these events will happen in what is termed the latter days. It's going to happen in the latter days at the time of the end prior to the establishment of the kingdom of God. And if you were to do a Bible study, and we're not going to do this tonight, but if you were to look at that phrase, the last days or the latter days or the last years, you would see that that is a biblical phrase that is often used throughout Scripture that refers to the time period both immediately prior to and immediately after Jesus' second coming. So that's when, the latter days. Hopefully sometime very soon. Where do these events take place? Well, as Ken asked us in listening to the reading to look for the nation of Israel coming up, the first thing we want to mark off is the identity of the land, the region in which this prophecy is concerned, which is essentially given for us right in this prophecy. This land, which is where the people are at rest and in which they dwell safely. And the land that we're talking about is the land of Israel. Clearly it is the land of Israel. Because as we read in verses 8 and 12, we're talking about this region which is referenced as being the mountains of Israel and dwelling in the midst of Israel. And so what we note in this slide here is where these mountains are. And they're right in the midst of the land. And this will become important as we discuss a little bit later on. The West Bank and the Golan Heights are the region of the land of Israel where there is an elevated topography. There are not hills, but mountains in this area. And this prophecy of Ezekiel, as we saw in verses 8 and 12, is talking about a confederacy coming against the people, and as we see here, against the mountains of Israel. So Ezekiel chapter 38 tells us that the nation of Israel will be dwelling in the midst of the land at a time when they are at rest and dwelling safely. Dwelling, as it says here in verse 11, without walls and having neither bars nor gates. Now you may be thinking, how is that going to happen? Especially in light of what we see in Israel today. 
We know about the ongoing struggles of Israel with the Palestinians and the Hezbollah. In addition to that, Israel is building a massive wall around the West Bank, that region that we were just talking about, the mountains of Israel. And in particular, a wall around Jerusalem. They call it the separation barrier in an attempt to provide better security from terrorists coming into the land from the Palestinian territories. And just a couple facts on this separation barrier. The plan is to build 430 miles of a separation barrier, and they are currently approximately 70% complete with this. So how does this make sense in the context of this verse, which talks about Israel dwelling in a place of unwalled villages? We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Or perhaps this reference could refer to other things, like Israel's defense technologies, which give them the perception of safety and security. Israel has leading technology, and they have some of the best engineers in the world, and they've developed what is called the Iron Dome. And what this is, is a radar technology that essentially has the ability to pluck out of the air a missile that is traveling faster than the speed of sound and blow it up before it has an opportunity to cross into Israeli territory and bomb a city or a village. So perhaps this verse is not referring to the literal fact that there won't be walls, but the fact that the people of Israel will be living in a state of mind which conveys a sense of peace and security. And if you were to look at the stats today, you would see that there has been a substantial reduction in the number of Hezbollah terrorist attacks in the land of Israel. It's down by tens of twenties of thirties of percent down from what it has been in previous years. And that's attributed to both the Iron Dome technology that they have, as well as the separation barrier that is 70% complete. Now Ezekiel tells us that this northern invader, this multinational force, is going to come against Israel at a time when they are living confidently. I would say that they're probably living pretty confidently with what they have by way of technology. Dwelling in the land prosperously. We'll take a look at just how prosperous they are in a few minutes. And at such a time, this massive army comes and brings destruction upon the land of Israel. This is what Ezekiel chapter 38 is talking about. So what conditions are to be expected then when these events transpire? We now want to just briefly touch upon those conditions. From our reading in Ezekiel 38, we saw how there was going to be a group of nations coming down from the north to attack the land of Israel. This name Gog appears. We'll be defining that shortly. But this Gog appears as the head of this group of nations. Now notice on this side, this slide, the description that is given regarding the conditions in the land at the time of the invasion. See, Gog, we're told, has an evil thought. And his thought is to go up to a land of unwalled villages that are at rest, that dwell safely, without walls, having neither bars nor gates. And here's the reason why. To take a spoil and to take a prey. They plan to plunder the land of Israel. So not only are they coming to plunder the land, but they're also coming against the people that occupy the land. So what we have here is not only just a typical, what you may have seen in you know, previous centuries, nation conquering nation because they want to take over lands and territories. We have here a sense and a spirit of anti-Semitism, a sense of being against the people of Israel is part of this evil thought that this northern confederacy, led by Go, has. Now we also see from this verse that this host comes to take a spoil. They come for the goods, if you will. Ezekiel sees Israel not only living in apparent peace and security, but also being a very prosperous nation. Having acquired cattle and goods, as we see, and they gain such abundance of wealth that it is regarded in these verses as a great Spoil. Now just recently, in October of this year, there has been a discovery which has been termed and phrased by the news community a game changer. And this discovery is of a massive oil field in the land of Israel. And you know where in the land of Israel it is? 
It's in the mountains of Israel. That West Bank region, and specifically the Golan Heights. The same region that Ezekiel 38 says the Northern Confederacy comes against and comes to attack. So perhaps this great spoil has something to do with this massive oil discovery, which has been found in the Golan Heights, the mountains of Israel, which is being called a game changer, which Israel believes, once they start production, will supply them with oil for centuries to come. Oil is an interesting one because what we find is, obviously, it's a natural resource. And it's very much a product that is related to supply and demand. And when we look at this northern confederacy, and specifically we'll be looking at who it is, it'll be important to keep in mind that perhaps oil will have something to play in this. Because when oil is not in high production, when it's not being sold at high cost, certain countries are unable to function as they would. And when other countries, which the U.S. is doing right now actually, putting oil onto the market, it brings the cost per barrel down, which hurts other nations. And specifically, one of those nations, which we'll suggest a little bit later on, that is hurt by such things, is this Gogian nation. Israel has prospered in very short order, given their relative young age as a nation. They've accomplished many amazing things agriculturally. We've probably learned in our history classes about how they've been able to use irrigation, to squeeze every last drop that they can out of the Jordan River in order to make those dry, mountainous regions into lush, fertile agricultural areas. And so we see then that Israel is today no longer what it was in the past. It is technolo technologically advanced. It is agriculturally founded. It is a successful and prosperous and trading nation which is exactly what Ezekiel chapter 38 says the nation of Israel needs to be in the latter days when this invasion happens. Now another important characteristic we can learn from Ezekiel 38 is the territory that is to be occupied by Israel at the time of the invasion from the north. We're told in Ezekiel 38 at the end of verse 12 that Israel will dwell in the midst of the land. It also speaks how Israel will, in verse 8, dwell in the mountains of Israel, having been brought forth out of the nations, being restored as a nation. And so here is the mountainous region called the West Bank, and up here we have the Golan Heights. And today, Israel dwells in these areas. Now, interestingly enough, there has been proposed over the years a two-state solution in which Israel would withdraw from these regions and allow the Palestinians to set up a state and Ariel Sharon was a proponent of this. And guess what happened to Ariel Sharon, Prime Minister of Israel? He suffered a catastrophic stroke, which removed him from power. And shortly thereafter, the plans for such things as a two-state solution died. They withered out. And so today, Israel still occupies these regions, which is to be expected. Why? Because God said so in the prophecy here in Ezekiel. And so we expect Israel to be restored out of the nations, restored as its own nation, which it is today, dwelling in the mountains of Israel in the midst of the land. And these are pretty specific references to geography. So Israel was not always its own country. And Israel did not always occupy the regions which are encompassed by this phrase, the mountains of Israel. Israel became its own nation in 1948, and even then it still did not occupy this region, phrased the mountains of Israel, which encompasses the city of Jerusalem, the city of Bethlehem, and the city of Beth and Hebron. But in 1967, we had the Six-Day War, which was significant, because the outcome of that event was Israel taking for itself the city of Jerusalem and the regions which here in Ezekiel chapter 38, the Bible says it would need to have at the time of the end. And so what we have here is a reference to Judah and Jerusalem, and God bringing them again from captivity to Judah and Jerusalem. And it's a quote from Joel chapter 3, verse 1, which says, For behold, in those days and 
In that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, because you see, they were dispersed throughout the entire world. And that was caused by things like the Holocaust and World War II. And going back even further, they've been dispersed ever since 8096, when Jerusalem fell to the Romans. And God says in Joel 3, verse 2, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage, Israel, of whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. So the point here is that God was going to bring again the dispersed Jews to their own place. And so God did return the Jews to the area of Judah and Jerusalem. And this had to happen prior to the gathering of all nations to Jerusalem to battle. That great gathering of the nations that we'll look at in a few minutes. But the important point is there will be Jews in Jerusalem and Judah at the time of this invasion. And this is a piece of prophecy that has been fulfilled in our lifetime as we took it to the look at. Israel now has Jerusalem. And Ezekiel 38 tells us that they will stay in this land until the time of the invasion of this multinational force that comes against Israel. In Ezekiel chapter 38, verses 2, 5, and 6, we read the following. Son of man, set thy face against Go, the land of Mago, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his bands, the house of Togomar, Togarma of the north quarters, and all his bands, and many people with thee. In Ezekiel 38, here in these verses, some of the participants in this coming crisis in Israel are identified. In these verses, we are given the names of the nations that will be involved in this latter day invasion. Now, obviously, these are ancient names. Not many of them probably appear too familiar to us. Most of them are not names of nations that we recognize today. <clears throat> we might recognize Persia, for example. That is now, today, the nation of Iran, and a little bit of Iraq. Ethiopia, we would know in the modern world, although the original ancient Ethiopia covered a lot more territory than that of the nation by the same name today. And many of us would recognize the nation of Libya, mentioned in verse 5. So some of the names of the nations mentioned in Ezekiel 38 will be familiar to us, but most of the nations listed we would not be familiar with, as they are the ancient names of the nations. Now, <coughs> it will be important for us to identify these ancient names with the powers that presently occupy the same lands, land areas of the world. And by doing so, we can identify the nations that Ezekiel informs us as having a part of the final fulfillment of this latter-day prophecy. So what we're going to undertake now is just a little effort of taking a look at some of these ancient names and trying to map them to the present-day territories that exist now. Now, one of the first names that we are introduced to in Ezekiel 38 is this funny-sounding name, Gog. Now, the definition of Gog, if you look it up in a concordance, and a concordance, for those of you who don't know, is simply an alphabetical index of the Bible with definitions to all the words in the Bible in either Hebrew, Greek, or Aramaic. And so when you look up Gog in a concordance, you'll see that the name basically means high. And you look at a few other Bible study tools like Young's Concordance. Young's defines it as a mountain, i.e. something high. Strong's Concordance defines Gog as something or someone lifted up, a prince or a leader in that sense. So once again, the same idea of something high in elevation or status. And the English and Hebrew Bible Students Concordance defines Gog as roof. Again, when you think about a roof, it is the highest part of a structure. So what we find in the context then is that Gog is a title, not a name. It's a title, much like Pharaoh was a title, right? Referring to the one at the top. In the context then, Gog is a title of an individual who is a particular leader that will arise in the latter days. Now, one point that we want to emphasize here before looking at the other nations mentioned is that this prophecy is very specific about the direction from which this confederacy of nations is coming. 
it clearly says in verse 6 that these nations are coming from the north. Ezekiel 38, verse 6, Gomer and all his bands, the house of Togarmah of the north quarters, and all his bands, and many people with thee, and also in verse 15, and thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts. So coming from out of its place, out of the north parts. There is no doubt about it as to where this nation and confederacy is coming from. They're coming down to invade Israel from the north. So then it is logical for us, when trying to determine the identity of this confederacy, to look for the leader of these nations to the north of Israel. As we read of this Gog coming from his place out of the north parts, we'll note that the RSV version of the Bible, verse 15, reads that Gog will come upon Israel from the uttermost parts of the north. So we're not just talking about something a little bit north of Israel. We're talking about Go coming from a place which is way north of Israel. And this is reinforced by a number of other Bible translations. The NIV says that the location of Go's place is in the far north. The Amplified Bible says from the uttermost parts of the north. And Rotherham's says out of the remote parts of the north. The New England Bible Sorry, the New English Bible. I don't think the New England states have their own Bible. The New English Bible says, from your home in the far recesses of the north. And finally, the Septuagint says, come out of thy place from the farthest north. So this is the sense that's being conveyed in the original language here, is that Gog's place is, from, is, is a place which is far north of the region it's invading, which is Israel. So it becomes clear then that we are not looking for a leader of a confederacy of nations that is simply north of Israel. For example, Lebanon, or Syria, or even Turkey. Yes, these are immediately north of Israel, but one that is located to the uttermost parts of the north, or to the farthest parts of the north. That will be the location of this Gog. So in the ancient world, from Israel, look as far north as you can. I think north is that way. Look as far north as you can, and that is where this go rules. So let's see what we can do about identifying this go. Josephus was a Jewish historian who lived in the first century AD, which was the same time period, by the way, as Jesus. And as a Jew, he had a good understanding of the Jewish scriptures, which Ezekiel 38 is part of, part of the Jewish scriptures. And Josephus gives us some geographical information when he says in his writings that Magog founded those that from him were called Megagites, but who are by the Greeks called Scythians. Now Josephus lived at a time in which he would know the Hebrew language and the Hebrew scriptures. He would also be familiar with the Greek world, as Josephus lived during New Testament times. So Josephus tells us here in this quote, that Magog is the same as Scythia. And if you were a Hebrew, you would call it Magog, because that was the Hebrew word. And if you were a Greek, you would call it Scythia. But they're one and the same. Magog and Scythia are the same place. So then, we can open our history books and do a little bit of homework on Scythia. Where was Scythia then? Well, we had the help of another historian named Herodotus, who lived about 450 B.C., now, Herodotus lived within 100 years of the prophet Ezekiel himself. So the information supplied by Herodotus is of particular interest to us as it would be around about the same time as Ezekiel lived. So Herodotus talks about this place called, this place called Scythia, and he outlines the borders of this territory known as Scythia in his writings. Herodotus tells us that the river Ister, which is also known as the Danube, is the most westerly river in Scythia. Therefore, the Danube River is the western border of Scythia. So here we have Ister, which is the same river as the Danube. And we're being told by Herodotus that this is the western border of this region called Scythia. Now Herodotus continues by stating that the Black Sea is Scythia's southern border. 
He says, Scythia begins and the Danube flows eastward into the sea. Across the Danube eastward, ancient Scythia begins and continues with the Black Sea as its southern border. So here we have the Black Sea. Herodotus also defines the eastern border as the Tanais River, which is also known as the River Don in Russia. Herodotus says there that is Scythia's territory runs south as far as the Torica. Part of it reaches as far as the river Tanais, which is the Don River. Once across the Tanais, one has left Scythia behind. So we started off with the Ister or the Danube River. We have the Black Sea on the south. And over here on the east, we have the Don or the Tanais River. So when we transfer this information onto a modern map, we can see that Magog is in this area here, bound by the rivers and the Black Sea, covering the territory that we would know today as partly Germany, through Poland, into the area known as Belarus, and even into parts of Russia itself. That would be the Magog of the Bible, according to the historian's accounts. But it doesn't end there, because... When we go back to the prophecy of Ezekiel, we find out some more information. In Ezekiel chapter 38, verses 1 through 3, we see that it is translated slightly differently. It says, And the word of Jehovah came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face toward Gog, of the land of Gog, of, of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus saith the Lord Jehovah, Behold, I am against thee, O go, Prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. You see, the King James Version, instead of saying the Prince of Rosh, says the Chief Prince. So the King James Version says the Chief Prince in these two locations. However, other Bible translations more accurately translate, as, translate this as a proper noun, as being somebody, the Prince of Rosh, the Prince of Rosh. And we just saw one example in the American Standard Version. And here are a few more. The New American Standard Bible says, The Prince of Rosh. Mofat's translation, The Prince of Rosh, and Meshach and Tubal. The Amplified Bible, The Prince of Rosh. Rotherhims, The Prince of Rosh. The Septuagint, Ross, Prince, Prince of Meshach and Tubal. And the New English Bible, The Prince of Rosh. You see, Rosh is the ancient name which refers to to Russia. And what we have here is the Bible translations picking up on the fact that in the original language, chief prince is not a title. It's a noun, a proper noun, referring to a specific person. And here we have uh, Jacinius, a historian, noting that Rosh was a proper noun of a northern nation mentioned with Tubal and Misha. Undoubtedly the Russians dwelling to the north of Taurus on the river Rock. So Jacinius helps to confirm this fact that we are talking about a proper noun referring to a specific northern nation, undoubtedly the Russians, is what Jacinius says. In 1739, Lowe's commentary on Ezekiel stated that Rosh, taken as a proper name, signifies those inhabit inhabitants of Scythia, from whence the Russians derive their name and origin. Furthermore, the historian uh, Bachart confirms this when he wrote, it is credible that from Ross and Meshek, that is Rossi and Mashki, of whom Ezekiel speaks, descended the Russians and the Moscovites, nations of greatest celebrity in European Scythia. Ross is the most ancient form under which history makes mention of the name of Russia. So we can draw a conclusion here. We pull all these pieces of information together, and hopefully you've been able to follow along, because it's been quite a bit. We can, can conclude then that since Gog describes a future leader that is associated with Magog, and since Magog occupied the territory once known as Scythia, and since Rosh also signifies the inhabitants of Scythia, from whence the Russians derive their name, 
that Ezekiel 38 is informing us that this Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rash, is a future supreme leader and ruler of Russia that has a strong influence over Western Europe. So then, we take a look at Russia. And what does the news show us today? Does Russia have a powerful leader? I would suggest to you that it does, in Vladimir Putin. Here's one article from the Bloomberg News, taken in June 2015, entitled, The Secret Money Behind Putin's War Machine. You see, we are almost going back to Cold War era times today where we have the Western and the Eastern civilizations against each other. And we have all these tensions. And we have the Russians, under the leadership of Vladimir Putin, up to no good. And we say, what are they doing? Perhaps they have an evil thought. We know they have an evil thought. That's what Ezekiel 38 says. So what is Russia up to? Well, if Vladimir Putin's end remain mysterious, this is what the article says, his end has remained mysterious, so do the means. Putin is allocating unprecedented amounts of secret funds to accelerate Russia's largest military buildup since the Cold War, according to data compiled by Bloomberg. The part of the federal budget that is so-called black, authorized but not itemized, meaning that you can't look at what it's actually spent on, has doubled since 2010 to 21% and now totals 3.2 trillion rubles. The Gadar Institute, an independent think tank in Moscow, estimates. Stung by sanctions over Ukraine and oil plunge, Putin is turning to defense spending to revive a shrinking economy. Remember we were talking about oil earlier and that massive oil found in Israel? Oil, oil field that was found in Israel? Well, Russia, Russia's economy is directly linked to oil. And if the cost of oil is up, Russia's economy does exceptionally well. Well, when Russia invaded Ukraine, a number of sanctions were put against the country by other Western nations. Sanctions which resulted in the price of oil from Russia plunging. And Russia has entered into a recessionary period. And so what is Putin doing? Well, Putin is turning to defense spending to revive a shrinking economy. What is the other way that a, that a nation turns its economy around? The U.S. experienced this. What do you do? War. You go to war. Exactly. You go to war to turn your economy around. So what's Putin doing? The outlays on new tanks, missiles, and uniforms highlight the growing militariz militarization that is swelling the deficit and crowding out services such as health care. Thousands of army conscripts will be moved into commercial enterprises for the first time to aid in the rearmament effort. Putin has increased defense spending more than 20-fold. In dollars, it exceeded $84 billion last year, more than any other nation except the U.S. Another article here. From Fox News in September 2015, Russian military buildup in Syria, unprecedented. So Russia has continued to build up its military, and now is also in a region which is north of Israel, very close to Israel's border. U.S. officials are expressing growing concern about Russia's military buildup in Assad-controlled Syria, calling it unprecedented, with one telling Fox News it compares in scope to Vladimir Putin's incursion into Crimea, Crimea, excuse me, Crimea. It's beginning to look like Crimea, the official Fox told Fox News. Two U.S. officials who have reviewed the latest intelligence told Fox News that satellite imagery reveals more flights of massive Russian Condor military cargo planes landing in Syria. They are offloading troops, including just under 50 Russian Marines and armored vehicles. U.S. officials said the Russian activity in Syria is unlike any they've seen since the start of the Syrian civil war four years ago. This is definitely a buildup straight out of Russia's military doctrine, said one official. And the point that we want to make here, under the comment that I want to draw your attention to, is that the ancient king of the north, or the Seleucids, which is in the region called Syria today, and the latter-day king of the north, as we're learning in Ezekiel 38, is Gog of the land of Mago, Russia. And so what we have is the new king of the north now militarily assisting the ancient king of the north. And it's almost as if God is saying, wake up. If you don't get the point, here we are, the old king of the north and the new king of the north, taking action, making movements. Where? 
in the immediate region and vicinity of the nation of Israel. What will it take to simply cross down south into Israel? An evil thought to take a spoil, to take a plunder of the land of Israel. Here we have another article from Newsweek in September. And basically what it talks about is this Russian president, Vladimir Putin, who I suggest to you is the supreme leader mentioned in Ezekiel 38, who's ordering stamped military drill of Russian forces. And what these are are basically drills that are taken as if you were in a wartime period. And the drill lasts until September 12th, and it will test Russian state service ability to respond to war-type scenario, including the Ministry of Health and the administrations of four nearby federal regions. Russia is preparing for war. And you can look at news article after news article. You can't look at U.S. news, unfortunately, because it's too often only concerned about what's happening in Hollywood or in, or in, the, uh, or in Washington, D.C. But if you look at some good news resources, you see that there's a lot going on overseas. And what's going on is a nation, by the name of Russia, taking actions which only a nation would do if they were preparing for war. So at this time, we want to get a feel for the extent of the alliance that will be with Israel. Or sorry, that is uh, the alliance or the confederacy that comes down to attack Israel. Josephus once again says, and helps us out with some of the geographical information relating to Gomer, which is mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 6. Josephus says, now these are the generations, sorry, Genesis 10, verse 2 and 3 says, now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and unto them were the sons born after the flood. And who were the sons? The sons of Japheth were Gomer and Magog, and we see Tubal and Meshach and Togarmah. So that's interesting because what uh, Josephus tells us is that uh, Japheth, which here we see was one of the sons of Noah, uh, began at Mount Ararat after the flood, but then migrated along Asia as far as the river Tanais, which was the Don River, and along Europe to southwestern Spain and settled themselves on the lands that are found therein. And so what we see here. I think that's actually what this slide shows here. That we skipped over. So, the descendants of Japheth, being Gomer, migrated along this route here and ended up in southwestern Spain. And some of them split off up here along the River Don. And so Genesis 10, as we looked at, shows us where the origin comes from there. So, what we have here, then, is Josephus goes on to tell us that Gomer founded those whom the Greeks now call the Galatians, or the Gauls, but were then called Gomerites. Although the Greeks referred to the Gomerites as the Galatians in Asia Minor, Ezekiel 38 verse 6 refers to Gomer and all his bands, or tribes. So Ezekiel does not just limit the reference to Gomer as the original territory of Galatia, but to the territory occupied by all of Gomer's tribes. tribes. Now, history tells us that the Galatians migrated across Europe over to Gaul, which, for those of you who know your history, Gaul is the early name for the nation of France. So once again, we are over into Western Europe. From parts of Russia to Western Europe, we see that this confederacy of Gog of the land of Magog, including the Prince of Rosh and Gomer, covers a large amount, amount of territory. So we have Rosh over here in Russia, Magog, which is Germany, Poland, Belarus, a little bit of, uh, of Turkey. And we have Gomer, southwestern Spain, and France. So we have Western Europe. This is what we see when we compare these ancient names to a modern man. And what we find then when we link Western Europe with Russia, Persia, Iran, and in parts of Iraq, and remember, Libya and Ethiopia, is that somehow or another, all these regions will become allied together for one single purpose, the invasion of Israel in the latter days. And we have seen some of these alignments taking place. In the Israel National News in April of 2015, we read that Russia wants to redesign the Middle East. You see, Russia thinks American policy in the Middle East has been irresponsible, that it can fix it, but is pursuing a strategy where Iranian power would dominate. Under the radar last week, Vladimir Putin met with Mahmoud Abbas in Moscow. The meeting was not considered remarkable as Abbas has started to visit the Kremlin on an annual basis. 
The timing, though, corresponded with Putin's definitely remarkable announcement that Russia would reinitiate its sale of S-300 missiles to Iran. Iran is Persia, and Persia is one of those nations that Ezekiel 38 tells us is allied with this Gorgian Confederacy. Very interesting. And so in November, just last month, we read in BBC News that Russia was to provide Iran with S-300 air defense missiles. They signed a contract to supply Iran with sophisticated S-300 surface-to-air missiles. The contract got the go-ahead after international sanctions on Iran were lifted earlier this year. Why? Following a deal over its nuclear program, which the U.S. had something to do with. So we certainly can see how all these nations are jockeying and making decisions which are inching the world closer and closer to the alignment that must be in place for this final invasion to take place. And so this is one example of the alliances which are now forming, which are to be expected based off of what Ezekiel 38 tells us. So Ezekiel 38 also tells us that there are some who will assist Israel in opposing this northern invasion. And we'll just quickly look at these in the time we have remaining. Ezekiel 38 lists a group of nations that will protest the invasion of the northern confederacy. And this list of nations in verse 13 makes up the other side of this future world conflict. The nations that will assist Israel in opposing the northern invasion include Sheba and Dedan, which we see down in the Arabian Peninsula, and the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions thereof. Now remember that these are ancient names for the allies of Israel. Who are they, and what are these young lions all about? Well, Sheba was an Arabian kingdom that was located in the southern tip of the Arabian Peninsula on the eastern spur of the mountain range that skirts the Red Sea. And you can see it identified on the map behind me. So looking at this, we see that Sheba is identified with the area that's known today as Saudi Arabia and Yemen. Dedan, on the other hand, has been identified with the area on the far eastern tip of the Arabian border uh, of the Arabian Sea. And uh, the countries that exist in this area are Kuwait and Qatar. Another nation that will assist in Israel, we're told, is Tarshish. Who is Tarshish? Throughout Scripture, this nation is known as a merchant power. And even here in Ezekiel 38, it's referred to as the merchants of Tarshish. So this nation is a Gentile nation, we learn from Genesis chapter 10. And there is strong evidence that the Tarshish of Scripture is Great Britain. And I'd like to present you with some of that evidence. First off, Britain's power was initially established on trade. It was a merchant power. According to Ezekiel 27, verse 12, Tarshish was noted for tin. It says that Tarshish provided the Phoenicians, that is Tyre, with silver, iron, tin, and lead. And interestingly, in his book entitled The History of England, the historian Coote states that Bocart is of the opinion that the Phoenicians called the island of England by the name of Baratanic, which means the land of tin, an appellation which the Greeks softened into Britannia, and once arose the Roman Britannia, which no doubt we would recognize as being very similar to today's Britain. According to Psalm 72, verse 10, which we won't look at, Tarshish is a monarchy. And today, Britain remains a monarchy. All of these factors point specifically in the direction that the merchants of Tarshish occupied the area that England eventually inhabited. So with Tarshish identified with Britain, the phrase with all the young lions thereof would have reference to the nations that come into existence through the mother country of England which would be nations like Canada, the United States, South Africa, Australia, Scotland, Ireland, the British Commonwealth of Nations. The reference of Britain as a lion and the nations that she mothered as her young lions is not a new revelation. In fact, it's been picked up throughout history and used, and been used by people who may not even know about Ezekiel 38. Here we have the royal standard. Britain's royal standard is covered with what? Lions. So they recognize and identify themselves as being a lion. During World War I, the British used these symbols to rep represent the same concepts. Here, 
We have a World War I poster depicting England as the old lion. They're standing on the rock, calling on the young lions of the empire to help in the war effort. This World War I postcard depicts the same thing, with the young lions here specifically identified as Canada, Australia, New England, South Africa, and India. And here is a World War I political cartoon showing the Prime Minister of Britain at his residence at number 10 Downing Street. And on the sign it says, all young lions are welcome. And the young lions, difficult to see, very difficult to see, uh, are identified on their bodies. <clears throat> There's writing there, New England, sorry, New Zealand, Canada, South Africa, and Australia. So from all this, we can know that the symbols of the old lion and the young lions are well-established symbols for England and the nations that developed as a result of England's influence. Thus, the alliances of this final conflict have been prophesied thousands of years ago. And this chart is captured on the handout. In red, we have the Confederate nations which will attack the nation of Israel in the latter days. Coming down into the land of Israel, from the north, the uttermost parts of the north. You can't get much more north than Russia. And then in blue, we have the merchants of Tarshish and her young lions. Israel, Egypt, Edan, Sheba, and Tarshish. Sheba and Edan, which in today's world are Islamic nations, Great Britain and the English-speaking countries that were once associated with England, will attempt to oppose the northern invasion. In Ezekiel 38, verse 9, it says, Thou, that is, the northern confederacy, shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands, and many people with thee. So now we have an idea of the participants of this coming crisis. We turn our attention to what the Bible says regarding the actual battle, which is known as Armageddon. Now this word Armageddon occurs one time in the Bible, and it is found in Revelation 16, verse 16, which is shown in part up here on the slide. And here what we have is a gathering of all the kings and all the nations of the earth to that great battle, the battle of that great day of God Almighty, and is going to take place in a location called Armageddon. This final battle begins with this Gogian host, this confederacy of nations coming down and invading Israel because they want to take a plunder of the land and because there is a hatred for the people. Here we see an illustration of these forces coming against Israel. And this illustration is under the heading The Controversy of Zion, which is taken from a quote in Isaiah chapter 34, verse 8. This crisis, this controversy will come to a head in this land, the land of Israel at this time. It's remarkable that this little puny region called Israel, so small in the whole scheme of things in this world, is going to be the epicenter of this final crisis which culminates in the Lord Jesus Christ's return. It shouldn't be any surprise to us, though, because although small in today's world's eyes, in the pages of Scripture, in the pages of God's Word, Israel has an extremely prominent place and has always been the center of attention. And so it only then makes sense that in the final days, it too will still be the center of attention. So how is God going to deal with this multinational force that invades the promised land? Well, in Ezekiel 38, verses 18 through 21, we're told what he's going to do. We didn't have these read for us, but here we're told that God is going to fight against this host. There won't be some countering army or superpower that intervenes, but Jesus Christ himself with the immortalized saints will intervene. Remember, this is God's land, and it is his chosen people, Israel, that are being afflicted in this process. It is also the same land that was promised to those who inherit the kingdom, promises which initiated with Abraham and which can be inherited by us through the waters of baptism. This land is the promised inheritance for those who follow the example of faith. Yet Gog isn't about to have anything to do with this. He's not interested in having a part in God's kingdom. He wants the land for himself. It is an evil thought. He's coming to take a spoil, to take a prey. He's going to control it, so he thinks. But he's not going to be able to. And as a result of this confederacy, God will intervene. And he intervenes spectacularly. 
The might and strength of the nations, with all their sophisticated technology and arms, will be turned into a scrap heap as the natural arsenals of a mighty God are brought into action against the wicked man. Ezekiel chapter 38, verses 22 through 23, foretold what will happen. I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood. I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him and overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstones. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself. And I, this is God speaking, will be known in the eyes of many nations and they shall know that I am the Lord. Now you know it's interesting that this confederacy coming down into the land, you would think that the allies of Israel would do something, right? I mean, that's why you have allies in the first place, so they can stand by you in times of trouble. Well, the record in Ezekiel 38 makes it pretty clear that they're motionless. In Ezekiel 38, verse 13, We read, Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lines thereof, shall say unto thee, This great northern confederacy, as it comes down to invade Israel, art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered the company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take a grace? All they do is ask questions. There's no action taken. But they're like, what are you doing? Are you, are, are, are you, well, what are your intentions? These are the allies of Israel. These allies are, as it were, standing at the side, astounded at seeing this Gohian host coming down against Israel. And they're just aghast and in disbelief. What are you doing? And you know what? We've already seen glimpses of this. Because what happened when Russia <coughs> decided overnight to go into Syria and start bombing cities and peoples? The same region that the U.S., this great diplomatic power with great foreign policy, is supposed to be intervening in. And the, Ru and the Russians are just like, Psh, time for new policy. Here's what we're going to do. What did the U.S. do? Well, what are you doing? What are you doing? They just stood there and asked questions, right? Same thing happens here when this invasion happens. Now here's what's interesting. Why would they not be in a position to intervene? Perhaps it's because they cannot intervene. Daily Telegraph, February 2015, says the UK cannot defend itself against Putin's military might. Britain cannot defend itself against the military threat posed by Russia. Senior army figures have warned. That's bad news. As two RAF Typhoon fighters were scrambled on Wednesday evening to escort Russian long-range bombers flying off to Cornwall, military chiefs said that the UK could not cope with an all-out attack as our defenses have been decimated. David Cameron said Moscow appeared to be trying to make some sort of a point. I don't think we should dignify it with too much of a response, he said. Probably because there isn't much of a response they can give. However, Sir Michael Graydon, former head of the RAF, appeared to take the threat far more seriously. I very much doubt whether the UK could sustain a shooting war against Russia. We are at half the capabilities we had previously. And why is that? Because of all the other wars that Great Britain, and the United States, and Australia, and the other allies have been fighting against terrorism over the last couple decades. It's depleted the resources. U.S. military, according to Washington Times, decimated under Obama, only marginally able to defend nation. The U.S. military is shedding so many troops and weapons, it is only marginally able to defend the nation and fall short of the Obama, Obama administration's national security strategy, according to a new report by the Heritage Foundation on Tuesday. The U.S. military itself is aging. It's shrinking in size, said Dakota Wood, a heritage analyst, and is quickly becoming problematic in terms of being able to address far more than one major conflict. Skipping down to the end there. So it is able to handle a major war and then having just a bit of residual capability to handle other minor crises that might pop up. But it is far cry from being a two-war force. And so perhaps this is why the allies of Israel are incapable and unable to help out in these latter days when the northern nations come down. And so unable to help in Israel in despair all of a sudden, as if by natural means, this huge host is destroyed on the mountains of Israel. And that is what Ezekiel chapter 38 tells us. That God will use his own means to defeat this nation. And so this is the first stage of Christ's victory in establishing up his kingdom, in establishing his kingdom. And the second stage happens after this, and that's really a talk for another time. Because you see, 
the rest of the nations and say, wait a second, what's going on? Who's this Jesus Christ? We think he's the Antichrist. And they form their own front against Christ. And so there has to be a second stage of victory where Christ defeats the rest of the nations in order to establish his kingdom. You can read all about this in Psalm 2. And so those nations would take counsel against Christ, which are talked about in Ezekiel 39, Psalm 2, and Revelation 17, will be broken. And this is the second stage of Christ's victory. And so when that happens, what we will have is Gentile powers that are completely broken. And Jesus will establish his kingdom over the entire globe so that these words from Revelation 11 on the slide behind me come to pass. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. That's the final picture. The Lord Jesus Christ will gain control over the world and shall then bring to bear righteousness as there will be real justice in the world. World events are transpiring now that are bringing us closer to this time that Ezekiel chapter 38 told us was going to happen, which leads directly into the Lord Jesus Christ's second coming. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 5 says that there is one God, one faith, one baptism. There are many churches in our community and many religions in this world with many different beliefs concerning God, faith, and baptism. The Bible clearly teaches that there is only one set of true teachings on these things. We welcome you to study God's Word with us, the Christadelphians, to discover Bible truth for yourself, so that you, along with us, can be ready for Jesus' second coming, which is happening very soon. Thank you so much.